Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's Friday. My petrol light had come on, but it always comes on when I start the car. Hello, the car in front of me is pulling out, so I'll wait for him to go. Don't run over the lady's dog. Oh, nice, full of these tribulations. So, how's it going with you? Dentists love to uh, have a moan. We like to have a moan, don't we, about how badly things are going. I'm not going to complain. Things are quiet at the moment at the surgery. Because I, you know, I qualified in 1981. I mean, right, you know, 31st of December 1981. So, I mean, it was 82 when I literally started working. And we were massively busy. I mean, you know, my, my uh, principal was booked up, I would say, three to six months ahead. I'm in mean, solid, absolutely solid. And uh, <clears throat> you get like a, a vicious circle effect where people can't get appointments. So what they do is they make appointments in case they need them. And that clogs the system up even further. So trying to get an appointment with him was, was a nightmare. And trying to get an appointment with me wasn't much better. I was booked up solid at least two weeks ahead. Anyone who needed any dental treatment or anything would, uh, you know, if they needed a filling, they had to come back in three or four weeks' time to get it done. And that's not what you want, is it? I mean, people want uh, speed. They want everything done yesterday, preferably yesterday morning, because yesterday afternoon would be too late. And uh, so that's one thing that. I mean, when the surgery is quiet, that's the one thing you can offer, isn't it? You can say to people, like, I can get you in towards the end of the week if, if you want to get that done. We never, we never, um, you know, I mean, there's always the illusion that you're busy, even if you're not. So if a patient says to you, you know, like, uh, you know, I've got a toothache, can I come in? And uh, you might have absolutely nobody booked in, nobody at all. And but, so what do you do? You say to them, um, uh, yeah, I could probably get you in about 11 o'clock. <laughs> but just in case they say, oh no, I can't, 11 o'clock, I'm doing something. You say, uh, or uh, I've, got a, I've got a space at half past two, which is true. <laughs> You've got a space at half past three, three o'clock, four o'clock and half past four as well. But you don't, you know, that's not what you don't say. You don't say, come in whenever you like. We've got nobody booked in. But uh, this sort of uh, needing to be busy, this busyness idea is uh, something it's almost impossible to lose. I get very stressed when I've got no patients booked in. And that's, it's a problem because, you know, we're doing okay financially on, on the books, we're fine. Uh, but, but I pace up and down like a, <laughs> like a bear <laughs> in a zoo if if uh, there's nobody in the chair and uh, from a business point of view that is a sensible approach because it's un you know you need to sweat your assets you need to have people in it's actually a fact I'm sure most people don't realize that you're better off um, agreeing to see someone and charging them a penny than to have all your assets sitting around and earning nothing because that's one penny more than you would have got if you hadn't seen them and the chair had just sat there completely blank. And an appointment for yesterday is worth absolutely nothing. So uh, you, have to, you have to fill up the seat. The seat has to be in operation all of the time. And I think, but it's difficult because, uh, you know, let's, supposing you're a dentist and you're booked up, say, half a day on average. So you think to yourself, well, I know what I'll do is I'll reduce the prices until I'm booked up all day. Uh, you know, because that is the sort of the inflection point, isn't it? The tipping point, the, the point at which that's the from the market's point, the, the you're selling your services to instead, you know, to the maximum number of people that you can sell to. However, 
does that that also maximize your profit this is the thing because you know I mean there are some things that you can adjust for example if you're you know if you don't have enough patients to fill up a week you can sort of effectively have a half a day or a day paperwork and then you don't need a nurse for that and so and you're you know I'm talking about sweating the fixed assets the fixed costs things like well obviously like rent and the rates but also you know chairs and anything that you can't send home for the day things that you can send home for the day you can you can save money on so you know the, the alternative approach is to say well I've you know if I've got one patient in let's say say the sake of argument one patient in for say 25 who's having a job for 25,000 quid and that's all I need to make my money for the month you know I want to turn over 25,000 pound a month and I can do that on one patient so I don't care if uh, 30 or 29 days of the month the surgery is empty as long as on one day I've got one patient worth 25,000 but that's the problem with that approach is that while it's it's lovely you can't be guaranteed you know you can't it's too much it's too hit and miss you have to sort of spread the risk because there is a risk that that patient will then turn around and say well um, either you know I've my finances have changed and I can't have the work done or I've had a rethink or even if they say um, you know I'm, I want to have the work done but I need to put it off a month because my you know my children are sick and I need to just take that day I've got to take them to have a pig world or something uh, and then uh, then you know then what do you do you go from triumph to disaster don't you in in a second and you can't have that degree of uh, risk associated with your turnover so I think the sensible thing to do is to try and broaden your base and don't uh, don't rely on small a small number of very large value jobs I mean it must be tricky let's say if you're a specialist orthodontist for example I mean, we, we had a patient in the other day a, a funny guy actually very nice Londoner you know very sort of sort of vegetarian Londoner and uh, came to see me brought a load of quotes and said you know I've been to my NHS dentist and the NHS dentist had started a root treatment on an upper right six and then shortly after the the dentist had done this root treatment um, he'd had a ton of water come down his nose and it turned out that the roots of this six are, are pretty well, you know, in the maxillary sinus. And so, uh, just, you know, we're just reading between the lines. I didn't really discuss it with him, but I mean, reading between the lines, I think what's happened is his dentist has sort of started this root treatment and gone up the palatal canal and, and sort of squirted some irrigation up there and hopefully not too much hypochlorite. And of course, it's come straight down his nose. Um, and so this is. It sort of, it was mildly concerning to the patient, but it was more worrying to the dentist, who immediately said, no, oh, this is a specialist job, you know, I'm going to refer you to a specialist endodontist. Now, you know, which is convenient for the dentist, because, you know, endodontics on the NHS is not, is a loss-making activity, and any sort of complication, such as a maxillary sinus, is, I'm sure is treated as a, good reason to divest yourself of the case to the higher authority uh, and therefore of the uh, of the work so but I mean there are no endodontic there's no endodontic referral pathway within the National Health Service um, there's no so so your only um, your only option is to refer into the private sector which is difficult, you know, because you've got a patient who perhaps is having a band two course of treatment anyway, and where the, the root treatment would be included in that and therefore free of charge and not result in any higher patient's charge. But then, um, you know, but then you're referring them out with the National Health Service, which I think, you know, I have a bit of a problem with that anyway, because you're, hello, someone's got a new Aston Martin. So you've got a, you know, you've got a, a patient who's 
expecting the treatment to be included on the National Health Service course of treatment that they're currently having and now finds that they've got a bill for over 800 quid in addition. Um, so anyway, he came to me and he'd been to the this NHS dentist who decided he wanted to wash his hands of the whole thing. He'd been to see the endodontist who'd said, yeah, we could probably do it, uh, be 800 quid. And he just wants to know, he, and he's gonna carry on seeing dentists until he sees one that tells him what he wants to hear. It's a bit like those property programs, you know, where they say, uh, you know, oh, not Sarah Beanie, what's her other name, the posh one, Kirsty, what's her name, and Phil. And they say, you know, what's your buyer like? Well, my buyer uh, wants somewhere in North London, preferably Mayfair or uh, Belgravia or uh, possibly uh, Kensington uh, Knightsbridge. And um, he'd like a, um, he'd like a five bedroom flat. Um, and what's his budget? Uh, he's got 250,000 pounds. <laughs> and he's looked at, uh, He's looked at 300 properties, but they can't seem to find anything they like. <laughs> so this patient's got this increasingly large amount of paperwork that he's carrying around with him, looking for a dentist who can do, you know, a reasonably complicated molar endo uh, and also not, not necessarily be the first person that's in the tooth. Because that, I mean, I was thinking, uh, <laughs> We, I was thinking of yesterday of bringing in what I call a typhoon tax, and a, ty, a typhoon tax is uh, something that we add on to the cost of jobs where we are not the first person to have done it. And in, this really applies to root canals. I had a guy in yesterday with a, a fractured reamer inside a medial buccal canal of an upper left upper left six, and. Uh, we, we knew the rimmer was in there because obviously we saw it on the pre-op x-ray when, when uh, we tried to re-root treat this tooth and it's still there and he's still having problems with this tooth. Mind you the disto buckle root is also hanging out of the, he's no, there's no bone around it and um, but uh, for, for me to leave a fractured reamer in a tooth is actually quite a big event because I mean I do take a long time. All, all my endo is done by hand and I don't rush and if there's a and I treat it as a personal challenge and an insult if I can't get a fractured reamer out so it must have been well and truly stuck in there for me not to be able to get it out but anyway he was he was happy with the, the, the efforts that we took but anyway where was I so So this guy's hawking around his paperwork, looking for a dentist who's, you know, like a specialist endodontist who'll do it for, I mean, and he didn't come see us. And I was charging him half what the endodontist, but I told him I'm not a specialist. I said, you know, and he, when he came in, he was like, oh, this is great. You know, I really like it here. You've got some approaches to, you know, the, the, the job, which, you know, I haven't seen anywhere else. and. This is, you know, and if I have the root treatment done, can you do the crown as well? You know, because I'm only looking for someone to do the root treatment, but, you know, perhaps, you know, now I like it here so much, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm obviously going to get you to do the whole job. And um, I'm going to be charged for a molar, for an upper molar endo, we're charging 395 he was and that's compared to the 800 he'd been charged by the endodontist and it was it was a, it was a you know this Thai food tax <laughs> when you go inside a tooth if someone else has been inside it and buggered it up it's one of the worst situations because there's all sorts of force there's ledges everywhere there's uh, false canals there's uh, glue I mean I had to uh, do a crown yesterday on a guy who was had a um, upper right lateral post crown and I call it a post crown really it didn't deserve the uh, the title of a post crown because 
what it was was uh, a crown which had been re-cemented using a bit of tubular stainless steel tube or something as as a as a core that fitting over a dentator's pin you know one of those screw those cheap nickel gold nickel plated <laughs> dentator's crap screws that if you put them in too hard splits the root and and but eventually just bends and breaks anyway so this crown came out uh, sort of a few months ago and i said to him like, oh, he said oh, you know what oh patience just stick it back in he said just stick it back in like you know like <laughs> <laughs> like if he backed into his garage and knocked his garage down and it's a pile of rubble and just said to the bird, oh, just oh just prop it back up will you just prop it just just stack the bricks back up again will you just stack them up i can't afford to build a new garage just prop just put it back up <laughs> so anyway i stuck it in for him and i said to him you know that's it i very rarely stick these things in more than twice i don't i will stick them in once uh, you know, on the basis that it's an emergency, and I say the bag of stick it in. That's it. That's your lot. So, so anyway, he came back to have it done, and um, because uh, it had fallen out again. But the problem was that the um, dentator screw had snapped in the tooth, of course, and uh, originally, and uh, so it needed to have a longer post in it. But in order to get the post up there, we had to get the dentator screw out which necessitates a post extraction kit, which cost 700 quid, which fortunately I used on another job, um, managed to get the post out, and then um, uh, and then, uh, then you've got to find the canal. And of course this dentator screw is not, you know, I mean, the route to the canal is by no means obvious because this dentator screw had been stuck in with a load of basically composite. So obviously a dentist who's putting in an ill-fitting screw that doesn't hardly touch the side of the root is in the inside of the root. He's going to use the hardest glue he can find, isn't he? And leaving some mug like angry to scrape it all out again. So we have to then so then we have to remove all the glue and then try and find the canal and then try and you know do enlarge the canal a bit, get it up to sort of 12 millimeters or something. And this is all in a lateral, which is about the smallest tooth that God made. So anyway, we did it, but the point was, you know, the, the, it, this is when I came up with the idea of a Typhoo tax, and it's spelled T-I-F-U, because it stands for Today I Fucked Up, which is what the dentist who originally did the work did. You know, I'm the, <laughs> I'm the one, or, or no, I mean, I'm not the only one, but I mean, you know, it's the second dentist that has to unfuck it all, don't they? And it's, you always think, oh, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I do these nicely normally, you know, I shouldn't shouldn't be much trouble converting this to something that's sort of normal. But um, when you, you know, we, we've got this hubris that we can say, oh yeah, we can do it. I could do that. Yeah, yeah, I could do it. I could do it much better than that. <laughs> and then what happens is when you start these jobs, you sort of run into the same problems. I mean, certainly you run into the same problems because the previous dentist gives you those problems. They, they say, okay, I fucked this up. I am going to seal it away and whoever un, you know, un, undoes it or when it all falls apart, they're going to have to get to where I was first and then get past that, you know, and then to, to do a proper job. So anyway, we managed to do it. We managed to do it. So, um, you know, he should be happy because he's going to get a crown. I've never seen a post crown come out if it had a post in it of about sort of 10 plus millimetres. I would say 12. And there's no point going any further than that, really. Uh, but if you're doing it properly, and I use Parapost system, which I recommend, always used it ever since it came out, which is a parallel sided um, post system where you put an impression post in the the uh, root and take a mould over the top of it. And um, we use a red, a red for a smaller canal, but almost always uh, black. Black is the sort of the go-to post. And it comes in three components. You've got the drill, which prepares the, the post hole. You've got the, um, 
impression post which goes you know goes in the hole and then you take the impression over and comes out with the impression goes off to the lab and then you have to have a burnout post which you give which we buy and we sellotape to the thing to give to the lab because otherwise they start you know they they don't have the com if they don't have the burnout post because the idea is that they just drop the burnout post in down the down the post hole and it's got the um, cement um, it's got like grooves on it so that when you stick the post in you don't get like a hydraulic compression effect because otherwise it's you know it will be quite difficult to locate the post so it's got sort of a fluting up the side which allows the pr pressure relief when you stick the cement in and you can tell if the technicians use the post because when the post comes back it should have all this fluting on it it should be like a little um, of these relief channels up the side to allow the pressure to escape if it doesn't have that then you know he's just literally uh, put, put some you know just some old crap paper clip or something down and, uh, and not used your your burnout post but it annoys me as well because these technicians they nowadays you know things are so much worse nowadays they don't have any of the stuff you know they're, they're so they're, they do so much crap work that they're not at all geared up to do anything of any quality and so whereas before I would have said to the uh, technician you know that I use the parapose system so you know you'll will put you know and it comes with a parapose which you'll you'll need to get obviously they add the cost onto your lab bill so I mean you know it's be no big deal for them but they won't buy it they just when they say no we haven't got them no if you want if you want us to use it you'll have to buy it you know, so we so we bought some and we send them off. Anyway, he's happy with his post ground. This other guy's unfortunately still got his uh, his uh, what's it fractured rema stuck up his mesia buckle canal, and uh, we're we're going to bring in a typhoon tax. But don't worry if you're quiet. If you are quiet, you know what? You know what? You spend half the time complaining that you've never got any time to do anything that needs to be done urgently because you've got some, you know, you're 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 too under too much time pressure because of the. Uh, you've always got patients booked in. in my space again and then you spend the other half complaining when you have got time to do stuff that you haven't got any patients booked in so can't win can you that's it this is the stress of being a dentist this is it this is why we're all stressed okay I'll uh, talk to you next week all right because it's Friday have a nice weekend bye